All right, then. It's finally here. The Guild Wars 2 Balance Manifesto. From Skills and Balance Lead. Cal Code. Of course, the Balance Philosophy. That's what this called. And actually, we got some really big stuff here. This is a big thing here. They said some very strong statements. I actually wasn't expecting them to be as kind of clear and um, precise with the way they describe things. Obviously, this is a high-level overview of their approach to skill balance uh, across other game modes, you know, all the game modes and so on. However, I think they actually did say something that they're definitely going to get held to. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what the November patch looks like. Now, to be clear, they did say that, yeah, it's obviously, you know, there are going to be some things that aren't going to line up with this philosophy, right? It's going to take a long time to actually get the game to where we want it to be. So I, I really feel like I've got to actually put that disclaimer in here as well, because always oh, people go, Oh, I'm the November patch, but you said this in the in the philosophy. You said it, right? <laughs> and they also did put the caveat here as well that again, you know, if they find that the philosophy is flawed in some way, then it will actually be changed, right? It's a living document, and there will be changes down the line and adaptations, of course, and all that type of stuff. Bonus meme, by the way. Next balance patch preview in two weeks on the 11th of November. Oh yes, let's go. Apparently, it's going to be a big one too for all game modes. So, very interesting stream, and let's go ahead and dig into that. There were a few topics that were talked about. Uh, there are goals, combat depth, and build complexity. That's going to be a fun one for all the people who don't like Mechanist. Gameplay roles across different game modes, right? Um, you know, and how they're handling skill splits and so on. Like, what is that going to look like? How are they going to handle this? That type of stuff. We've got um, uh, skill and trait design guidelines. So, like, making skills have a purpose, making skills not too overloaded, right? This one is really funny. Got a funny name there with holes in roles, but this is a big deal actually, especially for the support metagame uh, in PvE, and well, actually also World vs. World 2, actually, I think, so that's going to be a lot of fun stuff. Counterplay, minimizing bad choices as well, that's a really interesting one, and of course, a lot of player feedback here as well, and of course, a broad conclusion. But anyway, let's go ahead and leap into this. Some really exciting topics there to cover, and we'll just go through it one by one. So, I like that, wait, where's the T on this? His is a living document. <laughs> Okay, let's get into it. Goals. Fundamentally, our goal is to ensure that the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay in Guild Wars 2 is enjoyable for as many players as possible. To that end, we want to capitalize on the depth of the combat system to build a fast and fluid combat experience that allows players to express their mastery of mechanics. We also want to create a substantial number of viable build options and allow for a broad set of combat strategies in order to enable a wide range of playstyles. Yeah, oh well, no surprises there, huh? But let's kind of dig into the details here a little bit. Combat depth and build complexity. Guild Wars 2 has a deep combat system and players have a very wide range of mastery of mechanics. To put things simply, we want to build a game that is both rewarding and accessible for all types of players. Honestly, love to hear it. We want to design builds that allow players with a high level of mastery to demonstrate their prowess and be appropriately rewarded in terms of effectiveness. At the same time, we want to ensure that there are builds for every profession that require less mastery to be effective. These builds should allow players to succeed in parties and clear content while still having room for them to improve their mastery over the combat system and increase their effectiveness. So this is a very interesting statement here. And it sounds like they actually want to have a lot of variety. Um in terms of like skill level builds for every profession in the game. I think this is actually, um, this is very doable, but I think they've got to be a little bit careful about how they do this. So they want to make sure that there are lots of lower skill floor builds in the game, uh, but also some builds that have a higher skill floor as well. And they want to make sure that those builds are actually worth playing and actually have something that they bring to the table. Now, in my opinion, the way they do this is really important. For example, I don't think that, oh, this class has more buttons than the other class, therefore it should do more damage, or it's better. I don't think that's actually a very good way to balance it. Or, oh, this build requires more APM. I think that that's actually not a super good way to do it. Because, in my opinion, that's not what actually makes a build difficult or hard to play. APM can definitely be a limiting factor, particularly if uh, you have some kind of uh, limitation with, um, you know, uh, controlling a computer, for example. But I don't think those are actually super, uh, super skillful, actually. Um, I think what makes a build skillful is, is it very squishy? 
Is it ranged? Does it have a lot of self-healing and self-sustain? Um, does it have utility attached to it? Can it block? Can it destroy projectiles? Can it revive allies? Does it have a lot of boon access? Right? Those are the things that are really good. Does it have abilities that lock it in place? For example, one of the biggest downsides to have on your build in Guild Wars 2 is not being able to move. So, you know, like, that, this is why Deadeye should probably do, like, a zillion damage, because not being able to move sucks, right? It's really, really punishing and really hard to pull off. If you've got loads of skills that you've got to combo together, right, and you need to link them all together to make that effective, then again, you know, that's a very big opportunity cost in using these skills. This is the way that I think you go, okay, this is a hard build, this is an easier build. I think you want to be super careful with just looking at complexity, as in having loads of buttons. Because having loads of buttons, in fact, can often be an advantage, by the way. A great example of this would be Firebrand, actually. Firebrand um, has loads of buttons, but I think we'd probably broadly agree that it's relatively easy to play, right? Or at least to, at least to get your foot in the door. I think it does have a high skill cap, and builds with a lot of buttons typically do, because that allows you to react to a lot of situations and, and do a lot of things, inherently making the build stronger. Um, but having a lot of buttons is actually quite good because it allows you to be responsive, right? A, a really good contrast to this is something like Elementalist. Elementalist has a lot of buttons, but what I think Elementalist actually lacks is reactivity, funnily enough, um, because it has a lot of buttons, but they kind of all just me do damage, me do damage. As a result of that, an Elementalist build that has a lot of buttons should definitely do a lot of DPS, and, you know, Weaver should be a very high DPS build because it's, you know, often a melee build that has limited defensive uh, capacity a few here and there, but not great. And of course, it has 11,000 health. So that's kind of like the way that I would analyze this problem, rather than just looking at actions per minute um, and gameplay. And I think a big part of that is because I think getting over the uh, actions per minute kind of skill hump is only like the first step in mastery of the game. Mastery of the game is uh, a really long road. Guild Wars 2 is a hard game, a really hard game to play actually. Uh, and actions per minute and just pressing the buttons is a very small part of that. The biggest part of it is using your skills effectively, being reactive, moving quickly, adapting, supporting your allies, uh, knowing how to manage your cooldowns and manage your abilities. Those are what make the, uh, that's what makes the game challenging. That's what makes the game difficult there as well. Another thing that's kind of worth talking about with actions per minute is there are actually some builds that have high actions per minute but are actually pretty easy to play. It's why you want to be a little bit careful with balancing around that. Great example of that would actually be Scourge. Scourge is a pretty high actions per minute. You kind of, kind of mash your buttons quite a lot to be uh, somewhat effective with that build uh, but it's not the hardest thing in the universe to actually play as well. It's a very button mashy thing. So again, you don't want to just look at actions per minute. I think the same thing would be kind of true of Virtuoso too. Virtuoso is very fast paced, but it's not super hard to play. In fact, that's one of the reasons why it's so popular is that it is a relatively easy build to kind of get the hang of and leap on into it, right? And still go pretty, uh, still go pretty big. Yeah, same is true with Power Berserker as well. Power Berserker is a high octane build, a lot of bush ma button mashing, very high actions per minute, actually, um, you know, relatively speaking. But again, still a pretty easy build to play. That's kind of true with a lot of Berserker builds, actually, because you kind of do, you pump, you're blasting out those primal bursts all the time. All that kind of stuff there as well. Uh, but yeah, there you go. And I think, yeah, the, the overall goal of this is to make builds have a, a, a lower skill floor, right? so you can kind of get on the floor, but have a really, uh, a, a load of depth and intrigue into really mastering that build. Obviously, that may be harder to do with, uh, with you know, with some professions than others, right? And I think that's why they're going to be looking at making a few lower intensity builds um, for, uh, you know, for, for players who just, you know, don't really want to kind of sweat the game and kind of get into that tryharding element there as well. But there you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> it's fun stuff. It is a lot of fun stuff. This is also an important consideration for balance in competitive game modes, as the builds that are effective can vary significantly between different levels of mastery. Our goal is to create a fun and diverse metagame for as many players as possible, and that involves addressing builds that are problematic at any level, even if they aren't problematic at every level. This is very important, by the way. Very, very important. Um, because... And what the core of this is... You want to make sure that builds are even in terms of skill expectation. So what do I mean by that? You want to make it so that builds are about as hard to play as they are to play against, right? And to kind of contextualize this a little bit, let's talk about Dragon Hunter. Dragon Hunter, specifically Burn Dragon Hunter, was an absolute menace in Ranked. But why? 
Because at a high level, players figured it out, and actually it ended up being not super great because players figured out how to counter it, countered it, and shut it down. But why was it such a rank demon? Well, it's because Dragon Hunter, uh, honestly, this is kind of DH in general, but definitely the burn build, was a lot harder to play against and to counter than it was to play. And that type of mismatch is very problematic to balance, right? In the same sense, a build that's really hard to play, but is really easy to counter, yeah, that's also a really big problem on the other side. That build's obviously trash, right? Okay, you need to make it so that you have this evenness between that um, the, the skill expectation on how you play against it versus how you interact with it, uh, because otherwise you end up with some very, very serious balance issues. And I think that's what they're trying to get at here, right? And... It's good to know that they are going to be looking at that, right? Because obviously, um, you know, you don't want to have, like, these builds just running around stomping all the new players, right? You know, it's just not fun. Like, stuff like Flamethrower Scrapper, it's just not an enjoyable experience to play against as a new player. Even though, yeah, sure, you can counter it and you can learn to counter it as well. Because it's just not, it's not fun and interactive. So that's that about, um... Combat and build complexity. Again, I think I kind of went over that in a good chunk of depth there. Uh, but I think uh, I definitely agree with this uh, and what they're saying here, as long as it's implemented correctly. The risk of making builds that are, oh yeah, this build is hard to play, so it's better. The problem with that is you can end up with some very serious issues um, with competitive play. So when players start to get good, what you'll kind of end up finding is that certain builds just stop being in, in any way remotely effective. And that's why I think you need to have this slightly more more holistic approach to it and instead of going oh yeah this build just has a bunch of buttons so it's really good it needs to be more like okay this build has a bunch of weaknesses so we need to make sure it has a lot of strengths as well to balance out those weaknesses right oh yeah this build is really inflexible so it has to do this really really well oh this build um you know doesn't have any sustain so it needs to do this very well you know and so on right like rather than just saying oh yeah it's got buttons so it's really really good so Careful implementation can uh, work out very, very well there. And certainly raising the, uh, you know, uh, rather lowering the barrier to entry of getting into the game and being effective is a big theme in this document. They talked about this a lot on the stream, actually, with wanting to make the game more accessible and allowing players to kind of get their foot in the door and, you know, climbing the ladder of Mastery in Guild Wars 2, which I really agree with, actually. Uh, I would I loved um, buffing the core weapons, for example, and I want to see more of that. I want to see, let's bring some core skills up, let's bring some more weapons into play, right? Let's give players more options and more ability to uh, have different play styles and learn the game uh, in the way that they want to, right? So very, very big deal. Okay, gameplay roles. Roles are the general playstyle that a player wants to achieve, and they determine which responsibility a player fulfills in a group scenario. For the purpose of balance, we consider a few main roles for each game mode. While not every build needs to perfectly fit into a role, there are, uh, there are more common archetypes that we look at when balancing. Within a role, we want to balance builds to have a distinct strengths and weaknesses, and therefore different considerations when building a composition. There will always be some overlap, damage is like all good at dealing damage, but the secondary elements should be different enough that each build feels unique. Yes! This is actually how you want, if you want a diverse PvE meta, then this is what you've got to do. You've got to have, ooh, look, Vindicator is a power DPS build, but you get Jalus, so you have stability. Ooh, you know, Scourge is a ranged condition damage build that has Condi Cleanse and Barrier, right? Uh, like, oh, wow, we got all this crazy stuff going on there, right? That is the way you want to go. Oh, Virtuoso uh, has Portal, and it can take, uh, you know, it can take some stability and so on, right? Oh, look, Ranger has Dolyak Stance, right? And it can cleanse Connies with Bear Stance and share that out to you. Um, with all that kind of stuff, right? Like that type of little secondary piece of flavor can really, really help with going like, oh, wow, this is really fun and situational. The goal when balancing, especially in PvE, is to make things as situational as possible so that there's always somewhere where uh, each profession and each build is able to shine. So, yeah, definitely. Look, I told you they were going hard, right? These are very strong statements. I, you know, like if they deliver on this, they're going to, I'm going to be impressed. <laughs> So what have we got to say about PvE? What have we got to say here? PvE group compositions are typically built to maximize damage through high might, fury, quickness, and alacrity uptime, with just enough to support and events to keep everyone alive. So, what are the roles here? Damage dealer, boon support, and healer. Damage dealers are the primary source of damage built to maximize damage output. They bring minimal group utility, though they may share some offensive boons in limited amounts. That is interesting. Um... That's a very interesting thing to say. Uh, uh, ooh. In some ways, I actually hope they move away from that. 
I want to see DPS builds actually have more utility and more usefulness. Because it turns out that especially in pug play, in high level play, glass cannons are great. You know, uh, high level players, your know, speedrunners, you know, your snow crows or whatever, those guys love glass cannons that just do nothing but DPS. But actually, the majority of players... If you look at the builds we'll play, we're talking Scourge, we're talking Firebrand, we're talking Mechanist, right? We're talking Virtuoso. These aren't full glass cannon builds. The builds that really do well in uh, just normal PvE environments are actually kind of hybrid-y, right? Um, they're they're kind of hybrid -y. They're kind of useful. They do something. And I also think that happens to make them a bit more interesting and a bit more engaging to play. Nothing wrong with having the odd glass cannon, if you ask me. But I kind of hope they push more utility in every uh, DPS, but kind of have it a thing that it can do and bring to the table. Because uh, I think that's overall a better way to improve diversity. Otherwise, you're just going to pick whatever's got the best numbers, right? Which I don't think is super interesting. Boon support. A hybrid role focusing on providing high uptime of key offensive boons. Um, though a single build should not provide both quickness and alacrity. Yeah, no, no more, no more HOT Chronomancer. They also contribute to damage or healing in lesser amounts than dedicated builds for those roles. Yeah, that's your kind of your quickness firebrand, your heralds, right? All this kind of stuff. You know, your specters, right? You know, even tempest, right? Of course, potentially. Yeah. I think this is actually the coolest role, actually. This is my favorite one to play. So uh, I love that they're, you know, acknowledging it and they're going to keep pushing it. And then finally, Healer. A support role that focuses on keeping allies alive through defensive boons and raw healing. They may also provide some offensive boons to the party. Yeah, like, I, I actually find it a little bit unusual that they, that it, they did damage dealer, boon support, and healer. To me, it almost makes more sense to say damage dealer, boon support, or rather offensive support so support with damage and then defensive support so support with healing because healer is is this kind of right it, it is kind of this actually uh well you know most healers are well all healers it's a bit of a prerequisite almost that you are unless you're heal scourge i guess that you are going to be applying a good chunk of boons and i imagine they even want scourge to apply boons at some point kind of makes sense but you know you know it's it's mostly there and it's very interesting to actually see Arena actually define things. And this is why I thought they are going pretty hard and pretty intense. Because Guild Wars 2 has always been the play how you want. You know, it's an amorphous blob. Ain't are kind of laying it down. They're like, yeah, DPS, boon support, healing support. World versus world, support. DPS, PvP, support, team fighter, bruiser, roamer, side noter. And of course, these are things that have essentially been figured out, I guess, by the players, right? Like the players figured out the rules of the game and, and they get there in the end, right? That's basically what goes on here. Um, but I think it's really interesting to see Arena actually acknowledge that and interact with that and go, yeah, we acknowledge that this is how you guys play the game. This is, we know that you have these concerns and this is the reality you know we can have ideals about oh just play whatever you want but we acknowledge that yeah this is how the game is actually played by you in the game today i think that's very important i think that's very important in allowing the player base to feel connected to the developers there i mean you know we, you know, we don't have to talk about this too much i think because again in, in world versus world um it, it's a very similar thing right you know support is a broad term and yeah world versus world a lot of roles are very mushy, right? You know, you can have a boon support, you have Condi cleanse, you have a uh, raw healing. Stability is almost a thing on its own, right? Like, yeah, most builds in World of Sword are a bit of a mix here, as you can kind of see. And the, the big thing to take away here is the way they talked about stability, actually, and, and specifically Guardian in World of Sword. That's the big TLDR on this one. Um, is that... They want to share out stability so that Guardian becomes like, oh yeah, it's a stability -er and a healer. Great, awesome. But you don't necessarily need to have a Guardian. Guardian's basically been mandatory in World of Swords since day one of the game. That's no joke. Um, and they're really looking to target that. And I think that's a great place to start with World versus World Balance. And here we go. Let's have a look. I think the damn... I just spied something a little bit spicy here, actually. Let's take a look at this. There are builds that primarily ex exist to deal damage, but they also commonly bring additional pressure tools, such as boon removal or crowd control. As fights get larger, air of effect damage becomes more important and single target pressure loses some of its value. And yeah, this is very much true. You know, like, in a smaller fight, you might be focusing a target down, right, and trying to take him out in, like, a small skirmish or even, you know, a fight of 10 players. But as you get to, like, 50 players, yeah, you're going to be, like, pow, 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 like, dropping down big AoEs. So, 
I think they're I think they're almost hinting that they they want to have um, they want to almost balance the game based on the scale of the fight, right? So in other words, a, a ranger like a soul beast? Yeah, sure, maybe you're not amazing in a zerg. And I imagine they want to make a ranger build that's good for a zerg, but they want to highlight the fact that actually skirmishing play is where those kind of single target assassin style builds can still really excel. Um, and they want to consider that as part of the landscape of world versus world. Which is pretty interesting. They didn't even talk about Romas. I mean, they, they actually did. They were kind of memeing a little bit. But um, yeah. They were kind of memeing around a little bit. You know, I love to see it. I love to see it indeed. And in PvP, there's a lot of roles here, right? They, they spoke a little bit about this. It was very clear to see CMC's energy and passion about uh, PvP for sure. And this is what they've kind of defined here. And, and I actually kind of want to talk about something that they said here during the PvP section. The, in my opinion, was super important. You know, we can go over these definitions and what they define a support as, right? A support, you heal, right? You maybe CC. You have some kind of utility to enable your teammates. You know, team fight damage dealer. You're a squishy. You do a bunch of damage. Bruiser, you're kind of, you know, a, a damage dealer, but, you know, less DPS, but you're a bit more sustainy, right? All that kind of stuff, right? You know, you can kind of, kind of 1v1 a little bit. You're great in 2v2s and 3v3s. Romas, you're a thief or a rev running around blasting people. Side note, you're 1v1 and having a good time. You know, you can maybe do a bit in the team fight, you know, here, there. You can help pick off a target, but, you know, you're mostly 1v1-ing. We can talk about that for a while. But honestly, the big thing here is something super interesting. And this was one of my favorite things that they said here. They said that they want to make sure that within all of these roles, there's nuance. And what do they mean by that? Well, they mean that maybe you have a support that does a bit more damage, a more offensive support, right? Or a more defensive support. So for example, in PvP, you could have something like Tempest. Tempest is actually pretty aggressive, right? You can get in there and air overload people and like, bam, like zap people over, right? You know, you get your Gale and you have these big CC enabling combos to enable your team. Whereas a Core Guardian is a lot more of a traditional support. It's got stability, a lot of boon access, right? It's blocking attacks. It's got a lot of healing coming through there as well. You know, it's, it's pretty durable and tanky, right? Um, with that. So you have these very variances within these roles and i really hope to see that across all of um of the game too including pve uh it, usually in pve more defensive supports are typically favored but i love the idea that they're going to say you know what this support is going to be big damage right and going to bring some serious offensive power to the table loads of offensive boons there's going to be another support that maybe has a little bit less damage but maybe it's got some healing attached to it or maybe it's got more defensive utility that to me is a fantastic way to balance the game just across the board because it means that again you're more situational. It's like, oh, well, we've got a really massive healer, so we should just run an offensive support. Or maybe our healer is a bit more aggressive. It's more of an aggressive healer that does a bit of damage too. So let's actually put a bit more healing on our offensive supports and even on our DPS classes. I think that is, it makes building the puzzle and putting your group together really interesting. And I think it op opens up a lot of options and interesting way to play the game. Uh, oh, yeah, I've got to say, this philosophy, I absolutely love it. You know, I'm super hyped about this. You know, I, I genuinely was not expecting them to actually come out swinging this hard, like I said. And uh, everything they're saying here, I'm totally down with, right? It's like they're watching my streams and just ripping me off. Honestly, I should be getting paid for that. I'm obviously joking, right? To be clear, just, just in case... I did not have any part of this, right? And obviously, why would I? I don't work at Anet, guys, right? Okay, I'm not influenced in any way. Let's just, let's just get that out of the way. Uh, but, you know, they're definitely uh, in line with the way I think about the game. And honestly, I'm, you know, I'm, yeah, it feels pretty good. feels pretty good. Love to see it. Love to see it. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about skill and trait design. The following are a few key ideas that we consider when balancing skills and traits. This list isn't intended to be absolute in all cases, but there should be a strong reason when a skill breaks one of these rules. Purity of purpose. Purity of purpose is the idea that a skill or a trait or a weapon should have a well-defined identity. In other words, skills should not do too many different things at once. Some common skill identities include damage, defense, support, control, and mobility. So this is a big problem with power creep in the game. And actually, these next two things, purity of purpose and holes and rolls, these are some of the biggest issues, especially in PvE. Actually, big, big problems. And, and in World vs. World 2 to an extent as well. Um... This is very important. 
There are some abilities that are just so overloaded. And, well, I'm looking at you, Mechanist, right? Crisis Zone, Stun Break, Condition Cleanse, Alacrity, Protection, right? All baked into one skill. And an Aegis, by the way, too. Uh, and a Stability. Uh, I think I already said that one. But yeah, the, that is not good. You cannot have a skill that's that overloaded, right? On one button. That's crazy. Same thing on Firebrand, right? You cannot have a skill that gives you five more skills baked into your class. That's crazy, right? And there are a few other examples that we could go over, right? But you get the idea. Um, this has been causing a lot of balance problems, that versatility, that mechanical strength. Scourge is also another example there as well. It's so strong. Um, it really, really is to do that. And these things are the, the things that have been really distorting the metagame. And, and that's followed through here with holes and rolls, is the idea that builds need to have strengths and weaknesses. And this has been a big blight in all game modes. Guardian and Scrapper in World of Order dominate the support because they don't have weaknesses. They just do everything. Renegade and Holosmith in PvP were insanely oppressive because Renegade was amazing in teamfights. It was amazing in 1v1. It was amazing at roaming. It was good everywhere. It was good literally all the time. Same thing with Holosmith. And then in PvE, you've got these builds that are just good everywhere. They just do everything, right? Mechanist does everything. Firebrand does everything. Honestly, Druid in its day kind of did everything as well, right? Like these are the really strong builds that distort the meta. Funnily enough, guys, Tempest used to be that, right? Like, oh, how the mighty have fallen. But one of the first problems with balance in Guild Wars 2 PvE was that Tempest did everything. It could heal a lot. It could do loads of AoE damage. It was ranged. It even had boon access as well in a time where boon access wasn't as common. Like, these are the builds that really cause problems. And giving builds different strengths and weaknesses is really, really important. But one thing they did notice here as well, and I, I actually want to bring this up because, um, you know, you, you might get a bit worried about that, that you're going to get deleted from the game. They also talked about making sure uh, that there is going to be you're able to fulfill your role, right? So there, I imagine there is going to be like a baseline. Like th they, they have something in mind, right? This is what a support looks like. This is the baseline of what it needs to be able to do. That base level to make sure that a support build is able to function. Um, to just be aware of that. And this is kind of talked about, this, is, this was extended into with this power budget idea. This is kind of the same thing, right? The idea is, is that, well, if you have stability, right? And you have protection and you have Aegis, well, maybe you can't have swiftness and vigor right? Or maybe you're not allowed to have as much damage, right? You're going to have to sacrifice some damage for having all of those defensive boons. That's broadly what this is talking about. They used a really amusing uh, ticket uh, metaphor for this. Uh, it was unusual, but you know what? I liked it. Big fan of that. We'd love to see that. Yeah, skill with longer cooldowns can be more powerful, right? You know, it, uh, you know if you have... Uh, Loads of things you can do. You can cleanse con these. You can do more damage, right? Like it's area of effect. It's ranged, right? All these things are part of that power budget, right? Yeah. Ah. Oh. Adat traits should have less power than grandmaster traits. You know, this is kind of a, this is almost like a kind of like a psychological thing, right? Because essentially, adat traits and grandmaster traits are basically the same. It's kind of cool that the final trait is the most powerful, but it is a bit weird, right? Because of course, there's no difference really between an adat and a grandmaster because you get three of them anyway. But yeah, it's kind of cool that that's the way a grandmaster is better than an adat trait because this is kind of the whole like adapt and grandmaster idea. It's actually a relic from when the old trait system was in the game because back then there was a reason to have a distinction between the two because you could actually take three adapt traits if you wanted to you could put an adapt trait in your grandmaster slot and you obviously had to invest points to get you know all the way through you didn't just get all of it in one go with specializations you actually had to put 30 points to get access to your grandmaster um whereas now you know you just pick three right so that it's it yeah it doesn't really matter but you know it's just a little bit of a fun fact for the fact a little bit of a fun fact for you there play and counterplay Counterplay is important. And I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, right? With, especially with the PvP example, where you need to make sure that builds that aren't very interactive or are really hard to play against, especially for new players, aren't overly skill testing. You want the you want builds to to not be very hard to play against, but very easy to execute, right? And they also talk about instant cast skills here. Instant cast skills, or like very, very quick skills, shouldn't be mega, mega punishing to get hit by. You want to be able to react and actually respond, right? Instant cast stuff is a very strong thing. So those skills have to pay a heavy price. This kind of all goes into the power budget, right? If your skill is instant cast, that is a big deal, right? Like, you you know, being able to do that immediately, that means you can cast it while you're doing something else, You that's scary, right? Again, this is actually, funnily enough, one of the reasons why Scourge is so powerful in PvE is because all of its Shroud abilities can be used all the time, right? When you're stunned, when you're reviving, when you're using other abilities, that's a huge, uh, a huge advantage to be able to do that. Um, so, it's, again, 
I'm loving this. They're acknowledging everything I feel about balance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we also want to avoid instant healing so much. Oh, I love that. That is big. I think it's okay to have like a little bit of instant healing, like water achievement on elementalist, but it definitely is a problem. It's actually one of the things that I never really liked about core guardian support, even though I played it in PvP, was that it is kind of uninteractive. Like shout skills are a bit lame in PvP because you just kind of run around and you're going to heal people or cleanse condies and the enemy team can't really stop you. I think it's much better when skills have cast times. Stuff like water overload, wash the pain away, right? And uh, like those type of healing abilities, I think are much more interactive and much healthier for the game in terms of balance. And here is a big one. This is just another way of saying that we want as many build components as possible at M dash weapons. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, basically, um, there are obviously some weapons that are a bit crap in the game. A few choices you can make that aren't super hot, and they want to make them better. They can, we already saw like almost like the first iteration of this with buffing a lot of core weapons. And honestly, I love it. And it can really help balance as well, boy. It absolutely can, right? Because, for example, um, Dragon Hunter could have a really sick ranged option with Longbow. Okay, that's pretty cool, right? Um, you could make Warrior have Rifle for example, right? There's a lot of cool weapons and new builds that could fill different niches, right? And fill different purposes and functions um, that could be done by improving these weapons and making them uh, making them better, right? And yeah, this is what they're talking about here, of course. We love to see it. But of course, if you want to do that, as they say in this very article and indeed on the stream, we might have to do a little bit of skill splitting. We might have to break it out. Here we go. Skill splits. Guild Wars 2 has three primary game modes that are considered for balance. PvE, PvP, and World vs. World. Each of these modes requires different balance considerations, and it's not always possible to design a skill or trait that fills the needs of every gamer without any adjustments. Skill splits began as a system that allowed adjusting a skill or trait's effectiveness between game modes while maintaining consistent functionality in every game mode. If a skill applied quickness, it was required to apply quickness in every game mode with different durations. Over the years, we've seen the limitations of this approach, and we believe that the needs of each mode are different enough that skill splits also need to include some fun mechanical or functional changes. We started to make broader splits over the last few months. When we, when we decide a functional split is necessary, we still want the general purpose of the given trait or skill to be consistent across all game modes. Defensive skills should always be defensive, but the way a skill provides that defense may be different between modes. In cases where the core mechanic of a skill or trait is problematic in a particular game mode, we'll investigate if there's a way to rework the mechanic that feels good in every. Oh, no, we've got it. Oh, oh, oh. In extreme cases, we may decide to significantly adjust how a skill behaves in a single mode, but this would only happen if the skill causes a major bug. Oh, that is juicy. There isn't a viable rework, and the skill cannot be balanced effectively while respecting the, the usual considerations of skill splits. Ideally, we want to avoid splits of this nature as they significantly increase the learning curve for players who play multiple game modes, but we will still utilize them when necessary. Ooh, wah, wah. Okay. Ooh. I'm, gonna, I, I'm not a huge fan of this, actually. Um, I'm not into it. Uh, there are two approaches you can take. There are two approaches you can take. You can either do functional splits or you can basically make certain skills in the game mode. Well, there are three approaches. You can make functional splits. You can make certain abilities in a certain game mode trash, like really bad. For example, Scourge and Firebrand were really problematic in PvP. They were kind of destroying the game. So the balance team just made them both pretty bad in that game mode to remove the issue. Um... Or you can um, uh, fully rework the mechanic. And they actually did go over some of these options here. However, I'm not super into the idea of skills having different functionality in different game modes. For the exact reason that they mention here. I think it is confusing when you play multiple game modes. Especially for new players. It's already a massive learning curve. I think making it even worse is not ideal. Additionally, uh, I, I do I do like they're kind of thinking about it, you know, like, for example, Firebrand heal skill right now, it gives Aegis in PvP and World vs. World and Prot and Resolution in, P in PvE. So yeah, they're both defensive, and you, you just use it in a slightly different way, but they're both defensive. So I kind of get what they're getting at here. However, in my opinion, I do prefer the idea of kind of just nuking it from orbit and then reworking it. Right? And reworking the mechanic. 
uh, kind of, I think the scrapper change was an example of this not really working out super well. And I imagine they were kind of, they were definitely alluding to this in, in the stream as well, right? Like they tried to rework scrapper, didn't really work out. Wasn't the right solution. It was, it was too, you know, it, it was too feels bad man for uh, players who play PVE, right? Uh, and wasn't able to, you know, fix the stuff in, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't use that solution to fix the stuff in world versus world. However, I think that should be the goal would be to actually um, address it in the game mode by mechanically adjusting it in all game modes to keep it consistent. I understand why they're doing this and, you know, I'll begrudgingly accept it as a compromise. Um, but I think it is a solution that makes me a little bit unhappy um, with the way they go about doing this. I think skills actually should essentially be the same uh, across all game modes. If they need to be changed, if they need to be adjusted mechanically, then I think as often as possible, then it needs to be done in all the game modes. They just need to make a solution that's not going to upset um, everyone, right? And make sure that uh, make sure that the the skill is still fun to use in different game modes, or just simply kind of make it pretty trash uh, in you know in the game mode where it causes problems. Uh, because I think that that's a slightly cleaner solution and maybe a happier solution. They actually said um, also that they want to make sure that like every skill in the game at some point in the future has at least some application and with traits too. They don't want to have like a trait that's useless, right? Hello, 300 seconds. They want to make sure that all traits and all skills and all weapons kind of do something somewhere. And that, you know, as long as it's good in at least one game of that's all right. So I think they'd, I'd like to see them go more in that direction than kind of functionally split a lot. Because honestly, this stuff can pile up. That knowledge gap piles up a lot and i think we really need to have some empathy for new players here actually because there's look do you know how many elite specializations we have we have 27 elite specializations that all have their own skills have weapons and have mechanics i don't think we want to make it any more complicated right it's already pretty bloody complicated but yeah, that, that's that's what I've got to say about that. Not totally on board with that. I, I guess we, I kind of agree with them because they're saying we're only going to do like big splits, big mechanic splits as a last resort. And okay, fine. I'll take that. But when they do that, I would like to see them almost attempt to reunify it at some point. So um, I can kind of, I'll take what they've done right now with say Firebrand with the heal skill working differently and applying different boons. But I'd actually like to see them eventually unify it with a rework down the line. There's my, co see, compromise teapot. Let's fucking go. I'd like to see them reunify it at some point. Player feedback. The final topic we want to touch on is how we utilize player feedback throughout the design process for a balance update. Every update starts by determining what changes we want to make. We do this by following recent live data for each gamer to identify overperforming and underperforming builds, but also by reading through player feedback to check for common pain points. And this is important too, because numbers don't necessarily say that a build is fun. Really great example of this actually um, is something like Spectre. Spectre, actually super, super strong last patch, not so much this patch. However, um, it wasn't actually... It, it was having some trouble because it wasn't that much fun, right? And you might go, well, but the numbers are really good. It's really strong. Well, it turns out the players don't really like spamming wells off cooldown. And that is where the pain point and player feedback comes in. Because that is what you can't necessarily learn from a number. You need to have that human interaction to actually, to actually kind of get there on the ground and figure out what's going on. After we have a plan, we design a prototype, 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 prototype playtest, and iterate until we've taken our initial goals and turn them into a finished set of changes, ready for wider community feedback. Once we get to the preview stage, we collect player feedback from a wide variety of challenge, channels. At this point, feedback is even more important as it gives us insight into what potential problems exist in the upcoming update and what things we need to resolve between the preview and the live release. And we already saw this with Scrapper, right? They just changed it because the feedback was very, very negative and players were really upset that this was happening. And Honestly, this stuff is awesome. I mean, it would be great to have a full PTR, like a full public test server. That's probably not going to happen. Um, but this communication style that we've seen in Net do is fantastic. Every change that makes it to the preview is there for a reason. And it's important for us to provide that reason to make sure that everyone is aware of our goals. When community sentiment is negative around a particular change, it's important for us to understand why that is so that we can consider those reasons against the initial reason for the change and determine whether there's a viable solution. One last note about previews and feedback. Mechanical changes are the things we focus on most in the in the feedback phase. We do still look at feedback around numerical changes, but a lot of the time these can be more difficult to evaluate on paper and we usually want to uh, get some actual data on how they play out. Yeah, this is very good. You want to talk to the nerds about this. You don't want to say, uh, look, I've had people say, is Scourge still playable after it got nerfed by literally 5% DPS? Like, 
numerical changes are definitely a little tricky. You want to let the nerds get out the spreadsheets and then tell you, right? Or at least get in the game, get in a fight and see how it actually plays out. Because those are super hard to actually predict. Even if you are really good at the game, even if you are one of the nerds, it's still super tricky actually to truly evaluate how something's actually going to play out. Uh, numerical changes are also much easier to tune in later up this. Yeah, we've seen them hotfix this, even outside of the regular balance cycle. Exactly. This isn't to say that numerical changes will never get adjusted because of preview feedback. They're just a lower priority for us compared to any of the larger mechanical updates. And they explain this a little bit more on the stream, and I completely agree with them. Their idea here was that mechanical changes are a lot more impactful because they actually change your gameplay. Like, um, numerical stuff is like, oh no, my my attack hits for less damage. I mean, yeah, obviously that you know, it's like, oh no. But it's nowhere near as bad as like, whoa, this ability is not the same. I really like that playstyle. My playstyle is different now. So yeah, obviously mechanical changes, that's definitely where um, the focus of feedback probably should be, right? And I think it's good to just basically say, they're just telling us, yeah, you should just focus on that, you noobs, right? Uh <laughs> Player feedback is an extremely valuable tool in game design process. Thanks to everyone who regularly contributes to the discussion. And actually, let me just leap back here because there is something here that they actually went a lot harder on on stream and it was something that really needs to be brought up. I, I got baited by it. It's not in the article here. So they actually talked about the difference between a bad and a wrong choice. And this was a juicy statement. Like... I never expected the ArenaNet to say this. Anet basically said, yeah, you can make a build and you can pick the wrong weapons and the wrong abilities, right? Like, I, I, I almost want to make sure I'm, I'm not paraphrasing here and almost quote them verbatim just to make sure that, that um, they don't get memed too hard for this. There are bad choices, which are just objectively bad. You never want to use this skill. There's also wrong choices, which is the idea that as a warrior, I can equip an axe and that's a good thing. I can equip an axe and deal a lot of damage. But if I equip condition damage stats with that axe, it's not going to go well for me. And this really isn't something that we need to fix on the balance side or the design side because both condition damage stats and warrior axe are viable choices. They just don't work well together. And with any game that's, you know, delves into this kind of deck building space, this multiple build option space, there's always going to be the opportunity to make these kind of non-synergistic decisions. And that's not something that we can re realistically avoid, and it's right. not something we try to avoid because as long as these pieces are viable in their kind of their actual use cases, that is what we're going trying to get to. But essentially, what they were getting at was the idea that they they don't want every trait to be good in every game mode necessarily. They want to make sure that traits just aren't bad and there are a choice at least somewhere in some build in some context. But they absolutely acknowledge that, yeah, if you play like a Condi Axe Warrior, I think that was the example they brought up, probably not going to work out super well. If you play a Carrion Longbow Ranger, it's not that great. That's honestly a bit of a departure, actually, from the kind of play how you want mentality, I guess. Although, to be honest, play how you want, I actually think got twisted by the community rather than by the devs. I think the original intention of play how you want was there's a play style for everyone you know you can be a heel thief right well you can now anyway uh, you know you can do anything you can be like a, a melee elementalist you can play staff you can play scepter you can play dagger right you know you can play loads of different things there's loads of different variety in the game to me that was what they meant by that but i think people tend to interpret that as you can play literally any build and nothing matters and you can pick any skills but I, it's very interesting to, to hear that Arena actually acknowledge and to just flat out say it that, yeah, you can make bad choices. We're aware of this or we can make wrong choices. We're aware of this and we want to try and help players actually understand when that's happening. Right. Um, <laughs> maybe that's going to get slept on a little bit, but I was uh, really surprised that they actually they actually just flat out said, yeah, you can make wrong choices in the game. <laughs> And that you do need to kind of build your build and throw it together and have some synergy there as well. I like it. That was a very interesting statement that they uh, they made there. Interesting indeed. Oh, yes. And in fact, that was kind of a bit of a theme um, across the whole... I think they had a very down-to-earth view of balance. Like, my impression of ArenaNet in terms of their balance philosophy, it's always been I almost, like, idealistic. It's like, oh, you know... Look, you know, you can heal on this build. You know, it, it doesn't give any boons, but it heals. You can play that. Oh, look, look. You know, you can technically clear raids with 25k DPS. That means this build is good enough, right? It's been very idealistic almost, um, rather than like actual grounded reality. And 
I, I really would encourage everyone to watch the stream, by the way. Uh, more on that at the end, actually. But I really would encourage everyone to watch it because it was super grounded. Like, really, really down-to-earth acknowledging the reality of playing the game and how the players interact with it. And I really have to applaud that and, and, uh, and say that was something that I really, that really came across well. I was very impressed by that. It was super... You, you got the idea that they really knew and understood the player experience, which makes sense, right? Because, of course, um, uh, CMC and Roy, who were leading this uh, talk here, were, in fact, players, right? And still are, right? You know, CMC was talking about how he played the game since launch. Roy, as well, has uh, been a big player in GVG and PvP and so on uh, in the game for a very long time. So, uh, you know, these guys are very experienced. They really know what's going on. Um, and that really shows. And that's great. Really gratifying to see, actually, that we've got uh, players like that and, you know, uh, developers like that kind of in charge of what the hell's going on. You love to see it. As we mentioned back at the start, going forward, we'll be working to identify areas where the philosophy can be improved and resolve any outstanding issues where the live game doesn't align with the philosophy. One final note, we found the opportunity to gather initial feedback, wait, from either previous streams or forum posts to be incredibly valuable over the last few months. And we'd like to try to find more ways to get the community involved early. Finding the proper timing is the hard part, as we want to make sure we have enough time to put together an impactful update. But we'll be thinking about ways that can be um, used to improve the current process. Thanks, for, uh, thanks everyone for reading. We're looking forward to allowing, following the... Oh, we're looking forward to the following the discussion. Cal CMC Cohen, Skills and Balance Lead. Nice! Very big update. Strong stuff there. Big statements coming out and... Just to, to give my conclusion here, you know, this is obviously they're wrapping up here. Just remember, next preview's on the 11th, and hey, use the forums apparently. I actually want to specifically mention this. It's not specifically talk, talking about the actual content here as well, but I really want to actually praise uh, Roy and CMC uh, for their presentation. It, again, I mentioned it just a few moments ago. Super down to earth. They're both very charismatic. Their chemistry was awesome. Their delivery was entertaining. They were kind of joking with each other. They were messing with each other, right? You know, you know, <laughs> CMC was saying how he never replies to Roy in DMs, right? He was like, oh yeah, you know, like CMC never replies to me. That's what Roy said, right? Just a little bit of stuff like that. And I think that is really important and really note noteworthy of praise. I think historically, some of the biggest uh, discontent emerging from updates from Arena has been poor delivery on communication catalyst is meta defining right and all that kind of stuff right well there hasn't been enough there hasn't been enough uh kind of uh, humanity kind of baked into it right yeah and you know, you know that that kind of uh connection with the developers and i think that they really did a great job um with that they really really did um it's awesome to see these guys uh on the camera and talking and i'm really looking forward to the next stream actually they're going to be on the extra life stuff they're going to a halloween party right now uh but yeah they did a fantastic job they did a fantastic job of um, presenting this, and it was really entertaining, and I'd highly recommend watching the entire thing as well. It was super, super good. Great stream, slick presentation, no bullshit, um, and again, very grounded, very down-to-earth, so I was really impressed, and uh, I'm super happy that we have developers like CMC, Roy, and uh, Grouch as well, of course kind of on the team oh also definitely enjoy that meme as well okay they were they <laughs> at the start they made this joke about how you know <laughs> how uh grouch was calling them asking for staff ellie buffs because he main staff ellie and you know in world versus world uh <laughs> and it's just great it's just great that they have that chemistry they have that uh they have that you know uh, that ability to communicate effectively with people and you know and and not take themselves super seriously and, and realize the, you know, realize the actual situation in the game, right? It was just a good time. It was a good time. Kind of fumbling around there. Fumbling around with those words, but that's it. That's my conclusion. But anyway, I guess to kind of sum up, very good communication here um, from the team. Super interesting high-level approach um, with what they're taking here. It very much aligns with the way I think balance should be done. And it really hits a lot of important points about build diversity, about roles, about uh, situational power, uh, about compensating builds for having weaknesses, you know, range versus melee, tanky versus squishy, right? You know, like high utility versus low utility. Um, very, very happy with a lot of this stuff. Again, a little bit worried about the functional splits there overall, but hey, let me know, what do you gamers think? What do you gamers think about this? Let me know in the comments. Okay, if you're watching this on YouTube, you gotta look, okay? Go to the forums, but also use my comments as the forums as well, because why not? And of course, you know, do the usual stuff. Like, comment, and subscribe, everyone, okay? You know, like this, this, uh, make this a, a stream worthy of the YouTube algorithm. It's worthy of, uh, worthy of us, worthy of Guild Wars 2. So 
Might as well do one more as well. But anyway, thanks for watching, everyone, gamers. You love to see this. It's fantastic stuff. Definitely looking forward to see how how this goes. And well, <laughs> they've set a high standard here, right? That's the, that's the one thing I should maybe conclude here. Actually, let's conclude on that. They've set a very very high buy buy here, and that is the slight danger. Okay, of setting a bar like this is that they are going to be held to this. If they make a patch and it doesn't line up with this, then they're going to get roasted, right? <laughs> they are going to get absolutely roasted if they aren't careful. So there it is. You know, they put it on the line. You know, they're going for it. They're going all in. You love to see it, but let's see if they can pull it off. It's going to be very impressive. <laughs> but that's it. That is the long-awaited Balance Manifesto.